Welcome to the Firefly Tutors TV podcast, where real teachers from all over the country discuss real solutions for parents and educators alike. Here's your host, Marissa Johnston. Hello, and welcome to The Buzz, brought to you by Firefly Tutors TV, where we talk to administrators, educators, and parents all across the country about current topics affecting school children today. We're fortunate to have two guests with us today. Diane Cutler Lewis is an educator, entrepreneur, and philanthropist committed to helping students reach their highest potential. She founded A Plus In Home Tutors in 2003 to promote educational awareness and customized learning for students of all backgrounds and grade levels. The organization has grown to be one of the leading tutoring vendors to many charter schools and community partners throughout California. In 2021, Diane launched Firefly Tutors, presented by A Plus In Home Tutors, to continue to expand tutoring services with the goal of more positively impacting greater numbers of students in all 50 United States. Welcome to the podcast, Diane Lewis. Thank you so much for joining me. And who is joining you today? Well, thank you, Marissa. I have the pleasure of introducing Joe Schmitz. He is the CEO of Fit Leasing, a private equipment leasing company. He and his wife, Shar, have raised two lovely collegiate daughters who continue to make positive footprints in this world. Joe is a former board member of Orangewood Academy, and I'm proud to call him my friend. So thank you for joining us on The Buzz, Joe. Thanks, Diane. Happy to be here. Our topic today is private education, and Joe, you are one of the people who will know best because you enrolled your two daughters in private school, but due to the cost, private school is not always an option for most. Why did you choose private school for your children? That, that's a great question, Marissa. So when our, uh, so as, as Diane said, we have two daughters. Uh, our oldest is 24. And she's uh, wrapping up her her bachelor's at Cal State Fullerton, and our youngest is 19, and she's a freshman this year, just starting her education, going to La Sierra University, a private school. Um, when my oldest was five, we enrolled at the lo- local public kindergarten, and um, so she had a, there was a great principal and a wonderful teacher, but the reality is the system was overwhelming. There were 33 kids in the class, and um, my my daughter came in well prepared. As parents, we read, you know, to our girls from infancy, and you know they they were ready for school. And many of the children in the class just weren't, and so my daughter got overlooked because she wasn't a a kid that needed extra help. And she actually found it, it was unmotivating for her. So when she started first grade, we made a decision to go to a school that was a very academically focused and frankly, quite expensive school. And we were there from first through fourth grade. And I guess the results were mixed. Um, It was academically Uh, rigorous, but it was an adjunct campus from their main campus, and it didn't get the same kind of attention or resources. And uh, when we left after fourth grade, they actually closed that campus. So we were going to leave anyhow. Uh, And at the time, we made the switch to Orangewood Academy, which was a faith-based school and one we had a, a relationship with. Uh, so, and my youngest was starting kindergarten. So that was a good time to make that switch fifth grade and and kindergarten. And it was difficult. It was hard in terms of the, the finances. Um, uh, we had to make sacrifices and our kids had to make sacrifices. The, The reality is, is they didn't get designer anythings. And, um, you know, we, we made different kinds of, uh, uh, educational as well as financial sacrifices to have our uh, both of our daughters there, um, and it, and we think that it was good, uh, but there were challenges along the way. So, Joe, we'd love to hear your insight surrounding the benefits and issues with small schools or private K twelfth grade schools. Right. So uh, there were things that we loved about uh, our small school and private school experience, and things that uh, weren't as good as we would like. Um, So one of the benefits is uh, everybody knows everybody. Uh, Your teachers know all your students. Um, There were about 100 kids in the school. It was K through uh, 12, so there was about 
250 kids total, I think, uh, but 100 kids in the high school. And so your kids knew every student in the high school. And when you have 25 kids in the graduating class, they have a chance to get close to everyone. And your teachers know all the ins and outs of your students. And you know, as a parent, you know all the teachers. And you're very connected with what's happening in, in, in their lives, their educational lives, as well as their social lives at school. Uh, the other benefits are uh, your child has a chance to be involved in everything. So our daughters were involved in academics. Uh, they were involved in varsity athletics. They were involved in school government. They were involved in the music program. And so you can do a lot of different things, which isn't necessarily the case in a very large school. And it ends up looking great on a on a student resume when, you know, they were class president and they were a student body officer and, you know, you know, varsity, you know, sports for four years. Uh, so all of that looks great on a resume. So those are some of the pluses uh, on the minuses, though. Um, typically, at least our experience was small schools don't have all the resources that a larger school does. It may not have the resources for tutoring and support. Uh, we were fortunate that, um, with, that with our oldest daughter, when she needed some help in terms of math, Firefly was available, and we got tutoring for Algebra 2, and that, that made a difference. But we had to go outside of the school system in order to do that. Um, Sometimes it can be insular. You're, you're a, a big fish in a small pond, uh, which makes it challenging if you move you know, outside of that system, then there's a large adjustment. The other thing I'll add is, you know, what are the expectations of that school in terms of your expectations as a parent? Uh, and is that school the right place to meet those expectations, whether they're academically or if if it's a faith based organization, very often they feel like that is a priority for, over other uh, issues within the school. And does that is that a match for what you're looking for? And Joe, at what length did you go to to seek out those priorities at the school? Was it easy? Was it kind of was it something where you could? you know, talk to someone at the school, a school official, and just kind of get a gist from them of what their priorities were? Or what did you have to go through to, to make sure that your priorities matched and their priorities matched where you, where you wanted your girls to end up? Yes. Um, so the answer is you can always find someone to talk to. Uh, schools uh, of that size are always looking for volunteers. We were uh, ready and willing and available because uh, we considered our daughter's education a priority. So we were super available. I, as Diane mentioned, I served on the board for I think it was five years. Uh, so I was I was very much in contact with the principal. There were several principals while we were there. Uh, and because I'm involved, you know, they, they knew my name kind of whether they wanted to or not. Um, and we would we would ask questions. In fact, my wife actually ended up working there in the in the office part time. Uh, so our kids could never get away with us. Uh, I had an office. I closed it when my youngest daughter was was born and I've worked out of the house ever since. So whether home or school, our poor kids, you know, they, they really didn't have a break. Um, the, so you had access but also you have a small school with a small school priorities and they just may not match yours. And that can be frustrating. We, we certainly found that to be the case uh, because there were a variety of stakeholders who had different perspectives. So I would have preferred our school to have a stronger educational focus. And, and I don't wanna say it was a weak educational focus, well, so I'll give you an example. When our oldest daughter was in sixth grade and she was great with language arts, but math was always something she had to work extra hard at. And we were having a conversation with the math teacher, math teacher and I was saying, so I would like my child to be ready that she has a chance at any college that she might want. Uh, you know, that, that if she wanted to apply to an Ivy League school, uh, that it, at least she had an opportunity to to get in that game. And, and he said to me, he said, well, if that's really what you're looking for, maybe this is the wrong school. And I was, at the time, I was both frustrated and angry, you know, how dare he say that we're not teaching to that level. 
But after a couple of years, I, I understood his comment, and, and he was correct in that, that this was a school that was designed to provide an excellent education, uh, and it had a faith-based perspective, and it had a high college focus, but it wasn't specifically designed to have an, we're going to get you in the tools to be an Ivy League focus. Um, and I didn't get that then, but I understand it better now. Yeah, I, I mean, what I take from that is parents will have to speak up and really make sure that uh, their goals are known as well for their children. I, I would absolutely agree with that. And, and our philosophy uh, that we developed kind of along the way is um, is it was our job to do our best for for our children. So so in each class, it's the uh, it's the teacher's job to do the best they can for their students as a collective organization. It's not their job to do the best they can for our particular student. Sometimes those goals don't align given scarce resources. And I'm sure that's the case, not just in a small school, but in a large school. So their job is to make sure everybody in the class graduates. It's not necessarily their job to make sure that my child who is doing okay gets all the extra added resources to, do, to uh, excel at an incredibly high level if they have the ability to do so. So I have to both advocate for that, but also recognize that uh, the, the teachers got other responsibilities uh, and you know where is that balance? They're not just there for my child, but I am. So I have to advocate in a, in a, in a proper way, if that makes sense. I don't want to be the, the jerk parent, <laughs> you know, that they, that they run from, they never want to face. I want to be, you know, the teacher's best support, but I recognize that my responsibility is advocating for my child first. Wonderful. Thanks for the insight, Joe. And let's switch over to what you talked about earlier about how your daughters were kind of a big fish in the small pond and their resumes reflected that because they were able to become um, a part of any organization of extracurricular activities they wanted to. And, and I know for a fact your girls really shined in that area. How did that equate to college admissions for them? How did that translate for them? Oh, yeah, really, really interesting question. And, and uh, I don't know that my answer is quite as helpful. Uh, so their resumes were great. And, and my kids are really wonderful. I mean, I, you know, I know every parent thinks that. Uh, and, and ours are certainly exemplary. And, and I couldn't be more proud of them. Uh, and they truly were involved in everything. They, you know, they were class officers from the beginning and they were student association officers and not just officers that had a title. They were, they were active participants. Um, uh, when my youngest daughter, who, you know, she spent a year and a half, um, going to school from home during COVID, you know, which was so hard. And when she came back, she said, I, I have a mission to bring back all of the traditions and the connections of the school. And she threw herself into that. And she, she, uh, she was effective in the student association, but they also had weekly um, uh, uh, programs that they did. And she ran those, developed music, brought in speakers, uh, guest speakers, uh, and was just really kind of the glue to help um, bring the school back to the kinds of things that she remembered both as a freshman and when her older sister was in high school and she was on the outside looking in that whole school spirit. Um, you know, these were key elements that they did. So they had both the good things on the resume as well as the experience of, of working with people and leading and, and dealing with different ideas and conflict that can happen uh, and how you navigate that. So they picked up some great skills um leadership skills leadership skills absolutely and um but in terms of what that led to the resume uh, and in terms of college so um our girls were accepted into uh the local cal state schools they had the opportunity to go to 
uh, uh, the junior colleges and and for those colleges connected with the same faith as Orangewood Academy, they were uh, accepted into any one of those colleges around the country or around the world. But in terms of the the top level uh, UC schools or you know some of the Ivy Leagues that we looked at, they weren't. And I thought that the resumes were good, the grades were were uh, good. The SAT scores, which came into play for my oldest, were uh, were were good, uh, and yet, you know, we know that at a certain level, I, I think UCLA uh, two years ago had a hundred thousand applicants for for um, nine thousand positions. So, okay. you know, at a certain level, everybody's good, and and I, my, my guess is they they have to take a guess and say out of these 30,000 good applications, here's the ones we're going to pick. So uh, we did all the right things, but it didn't end up that particular way. I don't think that's the end of the world. Uh, I think that you can get a great education wherever you choose to, uh, that there are, there are excellent choices out there that don't necessarily fit in that Ivy League category or, or top tier category. You may lose out on some of the networking connections that you might get at those types of institutions. But uh, particularly as you're talking about, you know, ge uh, general education credits, English is English, right, for college one. Um, and, and so I think we'll be happy in terms of where our daughters are at. But so that's kind of my experience. I'm sorry, it's not a very A led to B. Uh, you know, but we're certainly happy that they got the experiences they did in high school of the activities they were involved in. Great. Thank you, Joe. Yes, thank you. And from what you're saying, I know you said, you know, the colleges don't always necessarily matter. It's the education that matters. And your daughters, as long as they have the ability to advocate for the type of education they want, which they would have picked up from you advocating for them, they will be successful. Do you feel that their private schooling helped them as well with advocating for their educational needs since they were kind of in a smaller setting and maybe had a, a little bit more of an ability to develop a stronger relationship with their teachers and peers? So that's a that's a tough one for me to answer because I don't have the contrast of what the experience might have been, uh, say, in a large public school with thousands of of students. Um, I certainly feel like they develop the interpersonal skills uh, to communicate with people and to communicate their needs or desires and to learn how to uh, negotiate and look for what they want. So from from that aspect, um, being involved in a small schools gave them lots of opportunity to try new things and to exercise their brain in ways that they might not have. Um, you know, in, in, in varsity volleyball, as an example, you're part of a team and you have to learn to work with a team. Uh, you also have to ex exert leadership. You have to deal with failure. You know, when your team doesn't perform well, either in a game or a season, uh, and you also have to deal with success when your team does well. You know, w what were the reasons for that and how do you learn from, you know, sometimes it's harder to learn from success versus failure. So I certainly think that in the, the small school setting, they had lots of opportunities to learn those skills um, that they might not have in other settings, but it's hard for me to compare. If you enjoyed our discussion today, please like Firefly Tutors on all our, your social media hubs like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Find us on Pinterest where we pin all of our favorite resources for parents and tutors. At Firefly Tutors, we believe every student deserves the opportunity to develop to their highest potential. See you next time on The Buzz.